Hello, everybody. We're going to start right now, but what we're going to start with is uh, just a little introduction of folks around the room. This is people who are here at the final uh, session in the final day uh, of a long conference to talk about ethics. Uh, so let's do some introductions from folks. Um, just say like your name and why you are here in this ethics session, and you're going to take like no more than you know like 15, 30 seconds or whatever to say your name and why you are here and interested in this ethics stuff. So with that, I switch those things. Yeah, just say who you are and. Krishna Andre, just learning. Uh, Arjun Hazard, uh, because blockchains are public goods. <laughs> that makes sense to me, yeah. Um, Mike Orcutt, I'm a journalist, so I'm interested in sort of the sort of newness of this discussion. I guess. Journalist perspective, nice. Hi, I'm, I'm Ruben. Um, I'm a well, you're now, but a million years ago, I studied philosophy, and so I'm always interested in people bringing in ethics where it may or may not belong, but I think it belongs here, so I'm interested. Philosophy. Oh, were you a philosophy PhD? No. Okay. Whew, good. Okay, then we can... Hi, um, I'm Jason Potts, and I do sort of social science research, so this is a, a, um, particularly interesting. Uh, Ellie Rennie from RMIT. I'm interested in the ethics question because, uh, you know, we talk about deploying these technologies as experiments, but when you talk about experiments, you also need to think about who you're experimenting on and whether they gave their permission and how. I really like that, okay. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Leo, Leo Lee um, from California. I'm a business entrepreneur. I'm just here to learn different aspect of uh, crypto uh, evolution. Thank you. I'm Arne Hessenbrook. I teach innovation uh, at MIT, but not at the Media Lab. And uh, I'm interested, so, you know, I need to know about new technologies, so any aspect of it, so including ethics, which is sort of a minor thing, of course. No, no, just trying to tease him. Hello, my name is Sabina. Um, I am here because I was just over there and I realized I don't know that much about Bitcoin to stay. <laughs> so I much rather learn more about blockchain ethics because I work with blockchains. I'm Michael Zargum and I design things that people use. So I feel that means I need to understand design ethics. I'm Quinn DuPont. I'll be speaking in a couple minutes. So I'll probably just say more then. Hi, I'm Patrick Merck. Um, I'm here because Reese asked me to be here. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'll also be chatting a little bit so you can hear my perspective. Um, hi, my name is Neha. I'm here because um, I'm co teaching a class with Reese this semester on this very topic. And uh, I care about it because um, uh, financial inequality really sucks. And I think we're building it into our systems. So, yeah. I am Cheryl Thompson, and I also came over here because that was way over my head. I am creating a network platform and wanted to see what, how blockchain can uh, help create funding for that as, as well as just interesting. I'm, I'm new to this whole crypto economic, economic so here to learn. I'm um, Sean Coughlin. I'm a graduate student, um, and I didn't... I'm kind of interested. This, to me, blockchain ethics is kind of a, well, it's an oxymoron, so I'd like to hear more. Um, good. Well, thank you for sharing. Folks who are new, sorry you're not going to get to fully share because people could come in at a, any amount of time. But um, I think one note here is I think a lot of us in this room actually have thought um, either a surprising amount of people in this room have thought a good amount about this and everybody here is interested uh, in learning more. So that's fun. So what we're going to do today is we're going to chat about blockchain ethics. Um, my name is Reese Lenmark, and uh, the goals today are we're going to do a little bit on like what is blockchain ethics and why is it important, just some context setting at the beginning. Um, and then Patrick's going to talk about kind of norms, ethics, and technology. And then Quinn's going to talk about some of his specific research recently around um, these guiding principles for ethical blockchain research. Uh, I'll do a macro like frameworks to understand blockchain ethics. And then we will have some discussion at the end with us on stage, but with all of you as well. Does that sound good? Uh, so. 
this is me. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. Um, yeah, so I, as Neha mentioned, I work, uh, I'm the head of community and long-term societal impact for the DCI. Uh, we're co-teaching a blockchain ethics class uh, this semester. Uh, Arn is one of our students. Woohoo! Um, and the... And other folks, yeah, yeah, he recently joined. Um, and so uh, I also, last year, I led the systems and, systems and society track at DevCon 4 at an Ethereum event last year that was all about this kind of stuff. Um, I self-tax uh, some of my income, which is fun because we, most of us in this room, I bet, have enough money. Um, and so you can see, this was as of a month ago, but this is how much is in my bank account, how much Ether I have, and how much Bitcoin I have. Uh, and then I host a podcast on Gray called Gray Mirror on this kind of stuff. Um, so this is the exact, thank you for saying this, um, so who, to give some context, who all here, just raise your hand if you think blockchain ethics is an oxymoron. Okay, not that many people, that's good. Um, uh, this joke gets made a surprising percentage of the time when I say I do blockchain ethics work. They say, haha, that's funny, uh, those two things don't go together. Um, and I think that, combined with this other piece here, which is, uh, and I just want to again want to survey the audience, how large of an impact, and so how large of an impact will blockchain have on society? You can either, a full thumbs up is like, this is going to impact society as much as the internet or something like that. A full thumbs down is like, this will not really impact anybody and will just be a little bit of a thing that a couple thousand people use. So give people, uh, go thumbs up to like thumbs down. Okay, I'm looking around. Uh, time frame. Over the next, let's say 20 years. Scope of the word blockchain. Uh, good question. <laughs> Includes CBDCs um, and permissioned uh, distributed databases with validator sets. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Da, da, da. We're getting two thumbs up from some people. That's not allowed. Um, no one. So no one gave below half. Uh, obviously, this is a very um, uh, this is a very specific subset of society. Um, but a lot of people gave something like surprisingly high. And the issue is that if you combine these two things, which is people laughing and then people being like, no, but this thing is going to have a big impact, that's just a recipe for disaster <laughs> for all intents and purposes. Um, so that's some of the context here. And I think that when we think about blockchain ethics and what's what will happen with it, what it is, is it's just, it's a field of people, just kind of like we're building a meta field here of, of this new academic field, but this one is just a field of folks and a community of folks who are focused on answering this question, how can we positively shape the development of this technology? That's kind of what we mean by blockchain ethics. Um, and you can kind of imagine it where it's like, on one side you have the state, these people do regulation, this is like the CFTC or the SEC or whatever in, in the United States. On the other side you have a bunch of companies and they're usually optimized for profit of a variety. Um, and then in the middle, in this third space, you have civil society. Um, and that's kind of where blockchain ethics lands. Okay, So it's kind of in between the state um, and companies. And you can think of it as part of this transition with almost all technologies where if you have a technology, then you will have a tech ethics group based around that technology because you don't just want the companies to do profit motiv motivated um, optimization for that technology. So when we had nuclear um, technology, we had nuclear security, AI, AI ethics, biotech, biotech ethics. If blockchain is going to be impactful, depends on how big, we will have a, it is inevitable that there will be a civil society based field of blockchain ethics. Um, and it doesn't really exist right now. Um, so this is back to this question that I posed here, which is if blockchain technology has even 10% of the internet's impact, we should proactively take great care in developing it. So depending on how high you think it is, uh, that's what's up. That's a great question. Um, so the, his question was, how, um, what percentage of the internet's impact has blockchain technology already had on society? And there's a slide that we'll look at later that shows that uh, all of cryptocurrencies are about 40x um, less valuable than gold. Uh, and so it's still a very small asset class, all things considered. Um, and again, this gets back to Michael's question around what do we count as blockchain technology with something like all the new um, uh, central bank digital currencies and things like that. 
I would say it's definitely less than 1% of the internet's impact as of right now. The internet has had a very large impact on society. Um, so I would say that for me, between like 0.1 and 0.01% is how big it would be right now, personally. Um, but doesn't mean we shouldn't be proactive um, because the dreams that people have, whatever you're worried about, whether it's the um, whether it's people uh, surveilling Bitcoin transactions or people sending bad you know transactions, whether it's something like Libra and these new kind of corporate cryptocurrencies that exist in the world, or whether you think that something like Bitcoin and these new this is like the crypto anarchist piece of like, hey, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies will be able to take down you know banks and nation states that those things could all have very large impacts. I mean, and we saw it, Libra, I think, was kind of a, um, a catalyzing moment for a lot of regulators where they were like, oh, we had been ignoring this world for a while. Oh, no, let's like reevaluate what we should do here and have a bunch of hearings about this stuff. Um, so you can compare it just as a, a reminder for how small the ecosystem is right now. Um, 10 years ago, there was like no AI ethics ecosystem for all intents and purposes, especially 20 years ago. But right now, it's a very mature ecosystem. You have um, a bunch of these places that have um, you know, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars of funding, um, lots of full-time employees, you know, uh, centers all around the world. And that's cool. You know, that's, that's good that that kind of robust civil society ecosystem exists. Um, but in blockchain ethics, it doesn't it doesn't really exist. We have essentially, so on the far left is this thing, Open Money Initiative, and that is, I would not call that a blockchain ethics thing, that is more something that's trying to help um, cryptocurrencies use in uh, hyperinflationary nation states. Um, you have some of these other like non profit things here. All these are essentially just lobbying organizations though. Um, no offense to all of them, like I love Coin Center's work, but it's primarily connected to DC from a lobbying perspective. And you have like some other weird things like this blockchain trust accelerator, but like all things considered, the ecosystem here for blockchain ethics is a lot less um, well-developed than something like AI ethics. Uh, so as we go into uh, the talks from Patrick and from Quinn, um, the question for all of us here is, in general, how should we you know, positively shape the development of this stuff? And also, how should we all kind of co-create this subfield of blockchain ethics as we do that? Um, so with that, I'm going to um, give things off to Patrick uh, for him to give some discussions. So let's welcome Patrick to the stage. Woo Thanks. I appreciate it. Um, I'm feeling super ethical, so I'm really <laughs> happy to be here. Um, as a lawyer, that's not always the case. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> always. He, he got it. He's a lawyer. <laughs> um, so... Uh, so yeah, so you know, when we talk about blockchain ethics, I think you know somebody mentioned it earlier. The first question is like, you know, what's a blockchain anyways, right? Because you know we're looking at like design thinking and you know what the implications of the technology are and and how the technology embeds certain norms and ethics in in it, right? And if we don't adequately define what a blockchain is in the first place, that makes it difficult, right? So I'm going to take a very narrow definition. You don't have to adopt my definition of it, but I'm just going to say basically systems that abide by Nakamoto consensus, right? That's the thing that was innovative about Bitcoin at the time, and when most people say blockchain systems now, what they're saying is not, you know, hash data structures, they're talking about the thing that Bitcoin created and kicked and the revolution it kicked off, right? So that, for me, is my definition. Again, you don't have to agree with it, right? There's certain implications about systems that abide by Nakamoto consensus that look like Bitcoin, right? With Ethereum 2 and others. They effectively empower individuals on the edge of the network, right? And they're, the point, the design goal is not to have intermediaries in the middle that you can turn to to remediate problems, right? It's a system of caveat emptor in a lot of ways, right? If you say fat finger a transaction um, and send, I send you 200 Bitcoin instead of 20, I may appeal to your good natured soul to send me back 180 Bitcoin but there's no buddy to turn to to say, oops, I made a mistake. Hey, can I get my money back, right? And that design has certain norms built into it, right? That wasn't like a mistake, right? It empowers people, but it also disempowers people in a certain way, right? Um, and we can see this play out. And I'm going to go back into like prehistory for a second to kind of think about like one 
one example, right? And I don't have like answers. This is hopefully just a bunch of questions and we'll, when we get to discussion, you know, we can talk about it. Um, uh, it was I, uh, uh, many, many years ago, there was um, a Bitcoin user who posted on uh, Bitcoin Talk. Everybody's familiar with Bitcoin Talk, the message board, right? Like old school, right? Um, and um, posted this idea that um, they were going to start a Bitcoin savings and trust, right? And so if you deposited some Bitcoin with him at the Bitcoin savings and trust, he would return 8% weekly interest, right? That's a pretty sweet deal, right? Um, by the way, the user was named Pirate at 40, so you knew it was super legit, right? <laughs> um, Pirate at 40 would give you 8% weekly interest on your deposited Bitcoin. And you know, there's a lot of talk about how that was possible, how you could be doing it, and all those other things. But one of the first responses was, guys, this is obviously a Ponzi scheme, right? I mean, everybody catches that, 8% weekly interest, it's obviously a Ponzi scheme, right? And one of the replies to that in the thread is, I know, but as long as I'm out first, it's cool, right? And everybody's kind of like, yeah. And so everybody actually, I mean, Bitcoin Savings and Trust did a lot of volume, right? A lot of people put money into this thing. Um, and Pirate at 40 turned out to be a guy named Trendon Shavers who was in Texas and he was like spending the money on like cars and gambling and like crossing the border and doing stuff, right? He actually didn't have any secret sauce. It was just a pure Ponzi scheme and the SEC investigated him and he was, criminal charges were brought against him and all those other things. So, you know, the long arm of the law, you know, applies and all those things. Um, but coming back to the blockchain ethics, you know, it, it was really interesting. It was sort of like a norm setting moment right, in some ways. You have this new technology where the existing norms revolved around systems that were intermediated, where you had a place to go if you made a mistake, or if somebody was running an obvious Ponzi scheme, they would shut it down. It wasn't this open network where anybody can participate, and all the responsibility is pushed to the edge users, right? The design of that system kind of established this norm that, hey, as long as I get out first, it's cool, right? Those are the rules of the game. Right? And we see this again and again in blockchain systems. I think in Ari's talk earlier about the flash boys, which is totally inappropriately uses the word front running because that's not what the legal definition of front running is. But the research is really interesting, right? The people who are acting as the miners in that space who are scooping up transactions, they could easily argue that that's what the technology allows. Those are the rules of the game. Why should I be treated, why should I, why should some third party from outside the system remediate this problem? It's not a problem. If everybody can see the rules, why can't I do it? If everybody can see the rules, why can't I run a Ponzi scheme as long as you know, you've consented effectively to the fact that you're engaging as a participant in the Ponzi and you're just hoping to get out first, right? Uh, and I think those, that set the stage for a lot of what we see, right? So now you, you hear the word bag holders used all across this ecosystem. Everybody's either a bag holder or they're holding somebody else's bags or unloading their bags. I mean, it's a loaded term, right? Like, this is a weird thing to be acceptable in if we're trying to like empower people and make the world better and financial inclusion and all those other things. If the language we're using is, hey, I'm just gonna drop my bags on this person or he's a, he's a sucker, he's a bag holder, you know? Or we're saying, alternatively, hodl. You should just be hodling, right? We have all these weird, like, loaded terms, and, I, and it seems like there's these norms that were established long ago, right? Get in the Ponzi early, get out, right? And you're fine. And if you don't, whose fault really is it? Is it the person operating the obvious Ponzi, or is it the person who didn't get out, right? Sort of a weird question. We see it again with the DAO hack, right? The people put a bunch of money into the DAO, the DAO gets hacked. I don't think I need to repeat all the facts around that. There, you know, you had some remediation, right? The Ethereum community came together and said, well, we're gonna fork the network and take the money back, right? But that violates the rule of the game, right? So who really stole the money? Was it the hacker who, made, you know, who took advantage of an exploit in the DAO contract to pull money out? Or was it the subsequent developers who instigate and miners and everybody else who coordinated to encourage a hard fork and change the, uh, the permissions on that address to take the money back, right, in the new, new forked version. 
right? It became that big split in the community and everything else. And that sets some norms around Ethereum, right? That were a little bit different from the norms you see in Bitcoin. But the design is the same, right? It's just in Ethereum now, and it kind of led to the big ICO boom and other things. The norm was, we'll take care of you, right? It's a science experiment, but we'll take care of you. But they don't really, right? I mean, we saw that with the parity bug and some other things. So how do you make that decision, right? I don't know. These are like, again, putting questions out there. We're designing these systems in a certain way where we're saying, the rules are set ex ante when I develop the software and we launch these networks and we're pushing all the responsibility out to the edge, in what cases are we willing to like remediate big problems, right? And especially when that contradicts the actual design of the system. And do we like the design of the system? Is that a good design? Is that a flawed design? Did we make a mistake in saying that Bitcoin is gonna be an amazing thing when it's designed in a certain way that, doesn't, that really says the rules are ex ante, caveat emptor, don't be a bag holder, that's how it works, right? That might be a system that's designed well for certain type of people, type of group or audience uh, or community of users and maybe completely uh, uh, misaligned with the expectations and norms of a different community. So anyways, just a little brief like a moose bouche before I turn it over to Quinn, who's gonna get into some uh, more interesting questions on uh, research and ethics and all those other things. And hopefully sparked a little bit of like interest in some conversation and dialogue later. So thank you. And as Quinn sets up, let's actually do one. If anybody has a question for Patrick about the norms of the community or how it's changed, does anybody have any thoughts or questions that come to their mind? Yeah. Um, given the fact that these decisions are norm setting, do you think then that sort of the notion of forking can be thought of as a feature, not a bug? Or, I mean, do you think it's a feature, a bug, or both contextually? Like, I mean, to me, uh, forking is a feature, not a bug, right? It's like the safety valve on any community. If you disagree with it's like very open source, right? If you're playing a game and you don't like the rules of the game, you can like pick up your ball and walk across the street and start a new game, and that's totally acceptable, right? If you don't like the norms of this community, go start your community, and if it's really awesome, then I'm sure everybody will go over there. And you know, we saw that play out in Ethereum to a large degree, and we've seen it play out unsuccessfully, like with Zcash, where the Zcash was launched with a founder tax, and some people objected to the fact that Zuko was basically going to get paid in perpetuity. <laughs> for launching the thing, which, you know, arguably he deserves, right? He started the thing, right? Uh, and so they, they launched alongside it a Zcash that didn't have the founder's tax. Was it like Zcash Dark or something like that? Of course. Which one? Z Classic. Z Classic, right, okay, of course, right? It's like <laughs> Coke Classic, Z Classic. <laughs> F -class. um, uh, so uh, they launched that, I mean, it, it went nowhere, right? Like it just, pff, nobody was interested in doing that. So obviously the community that was wrapped around itself around the Zcash as a network said, you know, it's probably a good thing that Zuko gets paid, so he sticks around and actually like makes this thing happen, right? But that's a, it's great. It's great that it happened. It's great that somebody tried it. It sort of like pressure tested the whole system and the theory that Zuko should actually get paid. Not that I don't like Zuko, Zuko you know, whatever you think about Zuko getting paid. The life or death or the, even the ball going and making another game, every example in that was actually about the people, not the code. Z Classic did go up like 100x when one of the devs announced that they were going to fork it into Bitcoin private and do some airdrop thing. So it continues to support your, your position. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The, yeah, that's right. And don't be the bank holder at the end of that, right? Cycle. Um, yeah, but uh, it is about the people, obviously, right? And that's the thing about ethics and tech and blockchain ethics and all of that is that you can't just say, here's some neutral tech that runs. There's implications of how you design the tech. There's implications of how that allows people to interact. And I think, again, forking is a feature, not a bug, because it allows people to have a say in the design of these systems, not just the ex ante once it's launched, but how they develop over time, right? At least that would be my take. But I'm open to other perspectives, of course. And I think turn it over to Quinn. Yeah, great. Thank you. <laughs> 